on heavenly wings. Cargo hand bones don't take off no smoke, no mirror, no strength. I can't take off these dark shades. I can only say how it's too beautiful. Our town, our town on TV, our town. Welcome to Our Town. I'm your host, Larry Frost, and I'm here today with Peter Hoyt. How are you doing, Peter? I'm doing well, Larry. Thank you. Uh, we're, I'm so excited today because the Elm Street Fire Station is opening up, and Peter's going to be interviewing a few current firefighters and past, correct? That's correct. So here's the mic. Thank you very much, Peter. Larry, thank you. I'm really honored to be here. It's uh, an exciting thing, and I'm really anticipating having a very lively conversation with these men. We'll have with us this afternoon the current fire chief, Jonathan Brickett, the assistant chief, Glenn Fournier. We also have recently retired fire chief, Bill Shute. We have a firefighter, David, a.k.a. Pencil Picard, who's with us this afternoon to share on the conversation. That's correct. And finally, we have uh, Bill Ryan. Bill Ryan is a gentleman who was appointed to the call firefighters, I believe, back in 1946 and served until 1989. An amazing man, 88 years old, and I know he'll have all kinds of, of uh, all kinds of stories. So. We encourage you to sit back and get ready for a trip into Amesbury's past, relative to firefighting, present, and possibly future. Yo, yo, I'll go behind the camera and let's get started. Sounds good, Larry. Thank you. My name is Peter Hoyt, and I'm the former principal of the Cashman Elementary School in Amesbury, and I'm currently serving on the school committee, and I'm delighted to be sitting with some pretty important people when we think about the Amesbury Fire Department, past, present, and yet to come. We're actually in the building on Elm Street, which is a pretty amazing structure. In preparation for this conversation today, I did a little bit of research and was really quite interested to discover that we obviously sit on Elm Street, which is one of the oldest roads in Amesbury, and we are on the original Carriage Hill. This is where it all happened and where the carriage activity really took place. Also on this site, from the year 1872 to 1884, sat the District 6 
Mill Village Intermediate School. It was here for just a short period of time, and then in 1910, the fire station was built. As I said today, we're lucky to have some pretty esteemed uh, gentlemen sitting at this table, and we'll begin the introductions with our former uh, chief at the Andrew Fire Department, Mr. Bill Shute. And right here is Bill Ryan. Bill is a member of the Call Firefighters. I think he began his service in 1946 and served for quite some time, ending in 1989. And we'll certainly want to hear from you later on, Bill. Uh, Dave, a.k.a. Pencil Pickard, who's enjoying retirement from the fire department, but served uh, an illustrious career here in town, serving in uh, the force. And then we're really delighted to have our assistant fire chief. Uh, we have Glenn Fournier Correct. sitting with us, uh, like your uniform, and also our chief, Jonathan Brickett. Welcome. Before we take a trip down memory lane, I think I'd like to start in the present. This is an amazing building, and I'm thinking about the sweat equity that went into bringing this building back. If, if I'm not mistaken, and I'll defer to you, uh, Chief Brickett, I believe this building closed in 1991 or thereabouts, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, 91 was the uh, closing. It was just after the Prop 2 and a half changes in the state. Incredible. And just recently it has reopened, and what an amazing facility. Uh, you talk about a facelift. I wondered if you and our Assistant Chief Fournier could talk a little bit about how this happened. I'm reminded uh, quite frankly, of the playground that was built at the Cashman School back when I was there as principal. Volunteer effort. Similarly, at the Amesbury Elementary School, an incredible uh, technology lab and art room that was largely the effort of volunteers. I'll be quiet. Really interested to hear about this. <laughs> well, it, it, it was started out as a vision. Um, and one of our philosophies in the office between myself and the assistant chief is we want to be fiscally responsible and try to do things the best way we can uh, with the least amount of cost. Um, this building had an opportunity to um, be rehabbed to a, to a certain point, that was the original plan, uh, and to get our staff in here. And it was all based on the headquarters station being inhabitable right now, uh, based on the mold problem we have. Uh, and there's a plan presently in place, and the plan that was in place uh, required us to relocate all our resources over here while they actually did the work over at the headquarters. And as, as the project progressed and uh, different philosophies came into effect, which was architects and engineers, when you get the engineers and architects in one room, they start to collide maybe a little bit. And uh, we had the opportunity to uh, staff this building with 50% of our staff and keeping 50% of our staff over there. And uh, as it related to what needed to happen here was a huge vision. And uh, the byproduct is amazing. As you mentioned, uh, we brought a, a lot of key players together in the department, people that had talent, uh, that understood the concept of construction. And uh, uh, it was a volunteer effort. I know our assistant chief, uh, he is pretty much the total responsible party for all the finish work done in this building. Um, uh, he has the background and the talent to do that. My, my deputy chief in charge of BMS and training, uh, with myself and many, many other people, uh, were involved in the uh, gutting and uh, just relocating of the different walls, uh, the flooring and the painting and the finish and the ceilings and all that. Other than the electrical plumbing and um, what's called it? Oh, a heating system, mm -hmm. we actually hired contractors because not one of us had a license uh, that, that could handle that type of a job. And this is just the byproduct of a really amazing group of people getting together and, uh, and re resurrecting this. Did I picture six or eight months ago that it would look like this? Absolutely not. We were looking at plaster and lath, falling off the, f the ceilings, off the walls, cracks, and I just shook my head and said, what are we doing? But um, here it is, it's beautiful. You must feel an incredible sense of pride. I mean, it's pretty amazing when people come together on a project like this and to see the fruits of their labors, just astonishing. When I started in the department in 1984, in 85, I was stationed here with uh, Pencil. He was my training officer. Um, and um, Taught you everything you know today? Taught, ta yeah, taught me just about everything I know today. Or a, or a, yeah. or a basis where you just, you just climb off of that. And I, and I really am the firefighter I am because of it. 
good guy? Would you dare to hazard a guess, uh, Chief Brickett, as you think about the cost savings? You may not be able to put an actual number on that, but uh, the immediate thing that came to my mind was with all this volunteer effort, I'm imagining there was probably some service in kind uh, that was donated. Would you, would you dare to hazard a guess what this project might have cost had it been done without volunteer effort? Well, um, the, the, the issue we sometimes deal with in, in the state uh, is the prevailing wage issue, which actually takes whatever, whatever investment you put into a property and, and, it, and, it, and it addresses that law within the state of Massachusetts. I see. And because it was a volunteer effort, other than the utility part of the, the project, right. uh, that all fell under that prevailing wage uh, concept. But the actual construction side of this, um, uh, the, the normal um, per square foot number is, is um, it was $250 a square foot. 230 a square foot is that's how they figure the prevailing wage, the, the you know, the contingency, the materials as it relates to a prevailing wage law. And we actually got this down to $33.33 a square foot. Wow. Well done. Yeah, it was a great effort on many, many parts. Absolutely. And again, I think just a, a terrific example of teamwork and what can happen. I'm also curious about the efficiency of services. I mean, we all know that. You're living out of a couple of trailers, sort of mobile homes, if you will, behind the current fire station as you deal with your issues with mold and what have you. But John and Glenn, together, if you could talk about the impact of this building now being open on the efficiency of delivering service. Well, I'll speak very quickly on it and then Glenn can pick up. Uh, we, we come from a two-station system. Right. Where, where uh, very few left in the department that started with it. I think there was four of us or five that actually um, is, are working today that uh, remembers that two-station system. So we're pretty comfortable with it. And our operational plan that we did, you know, uh, put together and, 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 and birth, you might say, is, is an operational plan back many years ago. We, had, we understood the whole concept. Uh, the, the issue of service, it, it opens up. It's the visibility on top of uh, or that just that warm and fuzzy feeling, know that you have a fire truck and an ambulance on this side of the community versus on everything on that side of the community. And I'm sure for the neighborhoods and the, and, the, and the businesses that are here, I'm sure that has a huge impact when they go by and they see staff there and they see you know, emergency medical services avail available to them much sooner than it would have been. Um, spreading out the, the, the compliment as we've done um, I think better serves the community as I can see it. So. Now, Glenn, I am I correct that you're pretty much have purview over this building? This is your base, or do you divide yourself? No, I'm both, both okay. sides. Yeah, yeah. But I can I can agree with the with what the chief said. I've I've heard from several residents and businesses on this side of town since this place was uh, slated to be open, and now that it is open, that um, they're very excited that there's somebody on this side of town again after so many years of just a vacant building over here and a lot of the businesses over in the industrial park and stuff they're, they're very excited to know that there's people here now it's certainly a great level of comfort <clears throat> i can imagine sure yep. yep dave when you think back to your service was this building open for the better part of your tenure as a firefighter yeah, all the way up to the core i was i came in in 76 <clears throat> and it was open and you worked out of both we got transferred back and forth yeah um, some some type of basis when the chief felt like he wanted to do that. But, sure. Um, yeah, so everybody got a chance to stay over here. How many chiefs did you work under? How many chiefs? Let's see. Four? Four. Something like that. Very good. I'm also curious, uh, and just a question for my own for, uh, edification, is interest in this line of work. Is there something that you always knew you wanted to be a firefighter when you were a young a young man, or even as a child? Well, I was uh, I worked at Sands Garage, and Arthur Gaudet, the old chief, used to come in. Right. Uh, Bobby Foster, he's the one that actually talked me into taking the test. No kidding. Says you got nothing to lose, take the test. And the rest is history. Other than right? that, the I had no other history. interest. But not history. It was the job made for me. Yeah. Loved it. How about you, Glenn? Yeah, I can remember. Um, Growing up on Congress Street, down the other end, 10 years old, riding my little bicycle up here, 
you know, back then they used to have the um, Explorer program, Explorer Post program, you know. Okay. And I, you know, ride pedal my bike down Congress Street to here, and I stopped in here one day and, you know, asked to get information on that. And um, believe it or not, I think it was I think it was Bob Gacton that was here at the time. Um, you know, he told me I had to go uptown to the other station and talk to the deputy up there. So I pedaled all the way up there and met with Deputy Fredette and gave me the old pat on the back, you know, and said, sorry, son, we don't do that anymore, but, you know, <laughs> come back when you're 18 and keep the faith and open the door and off I went. <laughs> Came back when I was 18. Okay. Is there a history of four news in the fire department? Uh, no, I had an uncle. Just one uncle that was a call man, um, Armin. I'm in Fournier. Um, yeah. yeah, that call, was uh, call that was uh, it. There you go. That's where I get it from. Then. <laughs> That's what they call me. Yeah, yeah. A lot of yeah, yeah. How about you, John? Yeah. Was was it pencil, who had an impact on your professional life, or were there other things that? There was a, there was a couple people um, that had an impact on my my career in the fire service. My great grandfather was a firefighter in Haverhill. I see. Uh, I was the only one out of the four boys that actually went into the fire service. Um, but I had friends in the fire department and uh, they encouraged me to, 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 to look at that. And it interested me to no end. I mean, I was um, like Glenn. I, I don't think I rode my bike down here when I was 10. Because um, I think I'd be grounded forever. <laughs> all right, a little bit of a haul. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I think all in all, uh, um, just, just knew a lot of people and really always had an interest in doing this. And, and I got to echo what Pencil just said. You know, this job was made for me, and this is the best career I could have ever chosen. I don't think I'd want to do anything else. Right. Now, John, what was your hometown? Amesbury. Amesbury. So again, we have an example. And were you Southampton, Pencil, or Amesbury? Amesbury. Okay. So yeah. three men giving back to their community. I mean, that speaks mm -hmm. volumes about Amesbury, but also about the fire department. Um, I want to take a step into the past for a moment, if I might. Uh, Bill, <laughs> how, does it, how does it feel to be referred to as the former chief of uh, the fire department in Amesbury? Just means I'm getting old. No, 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 no. No, uh, no it doesn't bother me. First I mean, of all, how's retirement been? For very you? good. Very Wait. good. Now, you're keeping your hand or a finger in the fire department in some way? Not at oh, all. Not really. Uh, you know, I think. It got to the point when it was time to leave, it was time to leave. And I, you know, I started, you know, ended that chapter and started a new one. Is your hat what you hurry? Yeah. <laughs> you know, no. Listen, <laughs> as you reflect on your career, how many years in the fire department? Count and call time. Yeah, call firefighter, 35 and a half. Wow. Is there any one thing that you're most proud of as you reflect on the time you spent serving Amesbury in this capacity or as chief? Boy, that's a tough one. It's, it's a few things, but, but probably the, the thing that most was uh, in, as, in my years as chief is, was being mentored by the former chief and then being able to carry on his visions and his uh, ideals right. to a whole nother level and making the tra uh, transforming or transforming, you know, whatever is the word, trying to bring it into a safer environment for the firefighters and new technology. And I think when I left in you know, John's hands and Glenn's hands, it was. We had set up a program with John's help and Bill Frost's help to instant management system on scenes, keeping firefighter safety. And I think the proudest moment is over the four years plus of chief was that uh, all the incidents we had, we had a lot. I think we had one minor injury through the whole thing and no one ever got seriously hurt or, or even, God forbid, killed in the job. And I think if you want to look, I look back there, that's the one thing I'd be proud of is that the fact that we were able to move ahead and safe wise and still do the job efficiently without putting guys at risk. And I think that's probably one of the proudest things I've done. Well, I'll tell you, that pride is justified. Uh, we think about the worst of fire and the other tragedies we've heard about around our country. It is pre pretty remarkable when you think about the history of the Amesbury's Fire Department. Um, transition. Was it a difficult thing for you? And you, Glenn, as you transitioned into your leadership role and took over from the regime of Chief Shoot. I have to, I have a great answer for that. Yes. <laughs> and, the, and the reason why I say that is the day um, I was appointed the chief, and the mayor handed me the key to the office and said, you, now, you are now the fire chief. 
I sat at the desk and I put my hands on the desk and I said, now what do I do? <laughs> so I actually took a ride. I uh, met with a very, really, really uh, close friend of mine, which is Chief Ralph Spencer in Merrimack. Okay. And I walked in and I said, what do I do? <laughs> and he gave me some really good information. Treat people the way you're gonna be, you want to be treated. And, and don't be afraid to step out of your comfort zone. And I've actually taken that really kind of deep down to heart. And Bill didn't just walk away. Bill actually, um, I was his deputy chief for four years. And uh, uh, he, he was instrumental in making sure that I had the, the, the core values and the understanding of what to do um, and, and to go forward. And, and we're successful. I think he's successful based on the other chief. And, Bill Frost is, was successful because of Arthur Gadet, and, and Arthur was successful because of the Board of Fire Engineers and all the people that were involved in the fire department. And this, historically to today, uh, and the people that take over for us, they're going to they're gonna find the same uh, uh, situation and, and just carry it that one step further. You know? It's beautifully stated. Our historian, Bill, a lot has changed, hasn't it? Uh, yes, there is. But if we're thinking, now you correct me if I'm wrong, 1946, right. you were appointed a call firefighter. Yes. You served in that capacity until 1989, right. a couple years before this building closed. Uh, during that tenure, you served as captain right. for a better part of it. Could you talk a little bit about firefighting then and how it's changed and how we find firefighting now? And there may even be some stories you'd like to share with us relative to this building, because I know you're in this neighborhood. You could probably walk to work if you needed to. Um, be really interested to hear what you might share, Bill. Well, my <clears throat> first experience, I it came on in here with a gentleman who lived next door. His name was Murphy. We were the first two appointed after the war, and uh, I was assigned here in. The old maxim. I don't think you gentlemen know the old maxim. We know it. It was a thousand gallon pump. It was a real powerful truck. It could go uptown through the square like nothing at all. And the old engine too came over here. It used to kind of chug up there. Well, anyway, uh, I started here. Scotty O'Neill was my captain. And Everybody that I served with today are deceased. I'm the only one left. Wow. So, my first experience as a, on the engine company, in 1947, we got a, there was a chief's call came in. We came over the station here, and they were sending us to Maine. I don't know if people remember mm. the fires down in Maine, but their, Maine was really burning. The, the, great, the great Woods fires? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, Engine 3 was designated to go to, down to Maine. And I can remember that night we left at something like 10 o'clock at night. George Grant was the driver of the pump, and I figured who else was on that night with George. But we left here with the, the blessing of the Slutman were over here. And Louis Bartley was the deputy chief, and I'm in Udon was the deputy chief. They went down in their car, we went down in the, on the pump. I can remember that night, I got on the top of the truck and laid up there. I think Duke Dillon was with me up there, but the rest of the guys were hanging on the back of the truck, <laughs> which is a, you don't see that today. That's a no-no today. But that's the way we handled things back in those days. But that was quite an experience down the main. Uh, I say Scotty was our captain, and one thing about when the captain was a, of an engine company or a ladder company, he always had the seat beside the driver. If you took his seat, you were in trouble back in them days. And when Scotty retired, Tom Coffin, I don't know if you people remember Tom or not, but he used to run the, the Daily News up here. And he was the captain. He retired, I got called up to the engineers and they appointed me. As far as dates are concerned, I don't, I don't remember the dates or anything, but I was about 20, 25 years as captain over here. But I did, <laughs> to go back to time, I did get into trouble. We were at a bad fire down in Newburyport one year, 
down to the uh, Lynch drugstore. It was really, really a good fire. But I was like a young fella. They used to be Cardwell rum down there, a factory. Well, they were passing rum out, and because me, I was passing the rum out, and I got in little trouble with the chief. Because <laughs> that doesn't happen today. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> so I got transferred up to Engine One. This is before I was captain. And I was up to Engine One for, I don't know, maybe three years, and then I got appointed captain. I came back over to Engine Three. So we had some good times. We used to bury them. <laughs> <laughs> Do you miss it, Bill? Yes and no. I mean, I, I couldn't do what we did back in them days. It's an altogether different firefighting than it was back in my days. Sure. We didn't have the Scott Air Packs like they have today. We'd go into a building like a... We used to have a fireman over here named Russell Welch. He like a bull in the china closet. But what a firefighter that guy was. He could go in and take the smoke better than anything. I can remember over here in the, the Brody Woodhill. He went to that building. But... He had three sons, one was turned out to be a permanent man, Ronnie, then he, there was two call men. But, uh, I, I became, I came under civil service in 1950, I took the exam. Bobby Foster was my cousin. And there was a group with Duke Dill, and there was a group that went up and took the exam in 1950, and I passed it. Poor Duke couldn't pass it because of his eyes. But I had an opportunity to take the job as a permanent men, but back in them days, the permanent men isn't the job there is today. Mm -hmm. And I like to be out with people. And I couldn't see being sitting in the fire station. Sure. So I worked in Bailey's for over 40 years, and I ended up over 20 years as a supervisor down there. People come up to me today, and they, they know me, but I don't know them. <laughs> it's okay. You've, you had know, just, you've had a lot of people yeah, crush your path. Yeah, right. Yeah. But I can remember what the chief said about the chief up in Merrimack told him, treat people the way you want to be treated. Right. And that's the way I always did with the engine company and as a, as a supervisor down the Bailey Company. Common decency. Yes, respect. Right, right, respect. But How many volunteers, Bill, were there back oh, in your God. heyday? i say at least 15, 12, 15. To a company. Yeah, mm -hmm. 45. Yeah. yeah. See, we, what the advantage back in them days, we had the Bailey Company. And the Bailey Company let us come out of the shop. What they did at the switchboard, uh -huh. they had a tapper there. I see. And when that tapper came in, you she would she would press a button and the horns would blow all over the different plants. I see. And they knew there was, there was a fire. So yeah. we'd run out and get in our cars and nine times out of you go down the plant one you see Louis Bailey coming up from his factory. We could follow him because he knew where he was unless you had time to stop at the desk and find out where, what the box was. But they were very, very fortunate down there with the Bailey Company. You know, they let us go out and, and uh, I don't know, it must have been at least 15, 20 fellows come out of that job at a, at a fire. Because I can remember when I went in 1946, the only way I could get to a fire, they have to hear the the whistle blow, mm -hmm. and the and the wind was blowing east. I mean, blowing the west. You wouldn't hear the alarm on this side of town. Mm. And then they went from listening to the whistle, they went to a tap. We had a tapper in our house, and uh, you'd get the same signal they get at the fire station.